Hello and welcome to this Live Faith TV presentation. Our topic today is God in control or not? Deeper thoughts about the problem of evil and free will. Hi, I'm Richard. Th glad you could join me today. This is a very important topic and very interesting too. I think you'll find it intriguing. There's a lot of conversation these days about whether God is really in control or not. You know, when World War II started, the New York Times printed, God is dead. So we look around in the world today and see what's happening, and it raises a lot of questions if you don't know God's word. Where is God? What's going on here? Why is there evil in the world? And these are good questions that deserve answers. And believe it or not, God, who created the heavens and the earth, wrote a book that reveals these things to us so we, so we can know. He wants us to know because God is love. That book is called The Word of God, and it's uh, called the Bible. That's what we call it. it. contains 66 books. It reveals Jesus Christ, who reveals God, so we can know what's going on. So uh, let's get into this subject. Is God in control or not? Maybe it's something you, you have thought about before, and maybe not, but it's time to consider it. Is God in control or not? Let's have a look from God's holy scriptures. So, is God in control or not? And if he is, or even if he isn't, why the problem of evil? And how does free will come into play with that, man's free will? So I'm gonna share the most common view with you. And this, you might believe this view. Um, most people believe that God is ultimately in control of all things, but bad things are caused by the devil. They believe a duality exists where one, not one, but two gods exist. These two gods are in a fierce war with human beings at the stake. The evil God is working to cause chaos and keep people from seeking and walking with the good God. The good God is fighting to save at least some of his people he lost due to him giving his creatures free will, you know, because man can't go beyond man's free will. God can't. So this most common view is mighty popular. It's taught in every denomination in the world. They believe that eventually the true God will win this spiritual battle and perhaps 10 to 15 percent of his creatures, his humans, will be saved. The other 85 to 90 percent are considered uh, collateral damage and are destined for eternal suffering. That sounds like a good plan that God would come up with, does it? But they're happy to believe that story. Some are ecstatic about it and try to push it off on everybody else. This story starts with the most beautiful and strong angelic creature who decided to use his free will to overthrow his creator, the good God. They say a third of the angels sided with this usurper to war against the good God. They say because of his pride, this spiritual creature and his cohorts were cast out of heaven to the earth. But for some reason, a little while later, the good God decided to create man on the same earth that he cast these myriad of evil spirits to. Spirits that man could not see, hear, or perceive. Why would God do that? What is this good God thinking of? letting the devil tempt his creatures. The story continues with the good God creating man fully in his image and giving man dominion over all the creatures of the earth. To test and prove man love, man's love and obedience, the good God planted a tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, told man not to eat of it, for he would die the very day he ate thereof. They say the devil possessed a serpent who snuck into the garden unaware by the good God, and tempted Eve, the first woman. She succumbed to the temptation and ate the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam, who also ate in defiance of the good God. They say Adam was perfectly able to resist this temptation from his wife, but ate the fruit anyway. Then they say God condemned Adam and Eve and all their offspring to a hell of eternal suffering if they did not repent. Their story does pride provide for salvation if one uh, repents and believes in Christ before they die, but only if they live righteously after they are saved. This story's consequence for those who do not believe before they die, no matter how they lived their lives or whether they heard the word of salvation or not, is eternal damnation with 
torment in fire. What a great outlook. Is that the story you believe? Is that what you've been taught? Is that the truth from God's written word, which he gave to reveal his son and himself to us? Does that sound like a God of love who is in control of all things? Does that sound like an only wise God who knows what he's doing, out of whom, for whom, and to whom all is? Does that story fill you with confidence that the creator God cares for his creatures? That he knows what's what what uh, how to win the hearts of his creatures? Does that sound like it? It doesn't to me. But the Bible does tell the true story. The word of God has it. Let's take a look at that. And now for the true story. God creates man in his image. Not created, as the modern translations say. In the Hebrew, it uses the indefinite tense, which we would call present future. It's not a one-time act in the past. It's a process. God creates man in his image. And this won't be this process won't be completed until what the word of calls God calls the consummation occurs, which is the last event of these Eonian times during which God is working at, out his plan, the consummation of all things. So who do you know now that is in the perfect image of God? Anybody? I've been around the world, many different countries. I've lived 67 years uh, of my life. I've not met one person I can say that is just like Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. No man is now in the image of God except Jesus. God has to perfect us. That's the lesson. We have no ability to perfect ourselves. And that's one of the things he's teaching us down here during the Sionian times, that we cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We cannot become what he wants us to be in the state we are in. That's what God's trying to show us. Now, I have a question for you. God knows good and evil, correct? He would have to, right? He knows all things. God knows good and evil. What about the image of God then? Wouldn't the image of God have to know good and evil? Of course, the image is the exact representation of the original. If it's flawed, it's not an image at all, but a counterfeit. So the image of God also has to know good and evil. But did Adam and Eve know good and evil? How could they? There was no evil present, so they could not know evil, right? And without evil, you cannot know good, because we learn by contrast and comparison. You would not know the color blue unless you could compare it with red, orange, yellow, and green, and other colors. You could live in a blue room all your life, and somebody asks you, do you like blue? You wouldn't know what he meant, because you had nothing to compare blue to. You have to have something to compare it to, to know what it is. That's how we learn. So Adam and Eve did not know good from evil. Hence, God planted the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. After Adam and Eve ate from that tree and disobeyed God, God said this in Genesis chapter 3, 22a. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. So knowing good and evil is a requirement for man to become like one of us in the image of God. Do you see that? So the fall of man, as it's called, is really man's first and necessary step to becoming like God, that is, to be made in God's image. So this was all part of God's plan, and Adam had no choice. The way things were set up, the way God set it up, God knew he would eat from that tree. Man must first learn good from evil, and that is what these Eonian times are meant to teach us. If you've never heard that phrase, the Eonian Times, I invite you to take my course on the Eonian Times uh, on YouTube or at livefaith.tv. The phrase Eonian Times, <coughs> excuse me, is used three times in God's Word. It's been covered up by wrong translation, but it's there. And something that's used three times is more than established. God wants us to know about it. So take that course and learn what these Eonian Times are. There's five eons long periods of time, that is, through which God is working out his plan. And we are in those Eonian times. The first step to man being created in God's image was to learn good from evil. And that's what we're doing here. 
Everything that has happened and will happen is totally under God's control. It all has a purpose. I'm going to show you some verses now that prove this. In Romans 11, verse 36, For of him God and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Ephesians 11, uh, chapter 1, verse 11b. According to the purpose of him, God, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, if all things are through him and to him and of him, and he orders all things after the counsel of his own will, is there anything left out? No, all, all in both verses there, all. The word things is not really there. It's supplied uh, to make sense of it, but it's talking about all creatures, not things. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases, it says in Psalm 115.3. That tells me God's in control. Isaiah 14.24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. That's a God is in control. Um, I have to check this reference. One of these is correct. I'll fix it when I put the slides down below. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Again, whatever God wants to do, he does all his pleasure. This word is used in 1 Timothy later. I'm going to, I'll, I'll show that to you when we get on with it. So God is saying he knows the air end from the beginning. If he knows the end from the beginning, he knows all things. He has to know the bits in between, too. You can't get to the end without the bits in between. So he knows it all from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Why? Because he works all things after the counsel of his own will. And Hebrews tells us that counsel is immutable, unchangeable. Psalm twenty-two twenty-eight. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. He rules over them. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it to bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall the word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, yet shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God is in absolute control. You know, he sends out his word. It accomplishes what he wants. He causes everything to happen. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Second Chronicles 20, verse 6, and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. God, all powerful, <clears throat> excuse me, all in control. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. <clears throat> As for you, you, oh, this is talking about Joseph. Remember, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. They, they almost killed him, but they sold him into slavery. And he ended up at the right hand of, of uh, Pharaoh, ruling Pharaoh's kingdom. And we have a type of Christ there. We have Pharaoh uh, as a type of God and uh, Joseph as a type of Christ. When God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and placed him at his own right hand, that's when, that's the simile. So God and Christ, Pharaoh and Joseph. And when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers after when he was uh, put head up over all Egypt and his brothers came, when he revealed himself, he said to them, they were very sorrowful. 
they realized what they had done. They were very repentant, crying. But Joseph said this to them, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This kept people from a seven-year famine that hit Egypt and affected the whole world and would have starved the Israelites. But by God doing this, he saved not only Israel, but he blessed Egypt and he blessed other nations through Joseph. That's part of the lesson of that story, that through Israel, God would bless all the nations. This is an example of it, the first example in Joseph and the Pharaoh. So, but what is he saying here? These people, his brethren, meant evil against him, but God meant it for good. This is a big lesson. God is in control. You know, I've heard the phrase, God turns lemons into lemonade. It sounds so good. Great, God can do that. But what I want you to know is God gives you the lemons to get the lemonade from. He creates the lemons. <laughs> he is in control, just like this. This was a lemon. His brothers wanting to kill Joseph, so, but he kept them from killing him had him sell them, sell them into slavery, raised him up at Pharaoh's right hand and blessed the whole world through him. That's what God does with his will. And, you know, why did his brothers do that? It had to be at the instigation of God. God just didn't wait for something to happen. Because as you're going to see, God caused the famine as well, because the word says he's in control of the weather, everything. He's in control of everything. So what we find is God architects things to bring his plan to pass, just like this with Joseph. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He, God, changes the times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Daniel 4, 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So much for man's free will, but we're going to talk more about man's free will later. Nothing can withstand God. God's will is much more powerful than man's. There's no comparison. It's, it's silly to even say that. Psalm 135, 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. That doesn't leave anything out. Everything in heaven and earth, whatever God pleases, he does. Genesis 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. Oh, I already read that. Sorry. Did I do this again? Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Lamentations 337. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Memorize that verse. This tells you that everything that happens is of God. Everything. Lamentations 337. Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? What insight. There's a big uh, debate between God's uh, determinative will and God's permissive will. But let me ask you this. If God allows something to happen, what's the difference between deterministic and permissive? It's still God allowing it. It's still God in control, right? It's a silly argument, really. Ephesians 1.4, even as he chose us in him from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. For God to choose a believer from before the foundation of the earth, he has to know that entire believer's bloodline. If you are a believer, he chose you from before the foundation or the disruption of the earth is the word in the Greek. It means disruption. Kataboli, not the normal word for foundation, which was uh, familios. This is kataboli. You can do a word study on that in Strong's Concordance and see all the verses about it. I present it in uh, the Eonian Times course, by the way. So for God to choose us be before he even made man, he had to know who your parents were, 
He had to know who your grandparents were. He had to know your grandfather wasn't killed in World War One or two. He had to know weather didn't destroy, a tsunami didn't come and destroy somebody uh, earlier up in your bloodline. He had to know the whole thing. Can you see it? For him to choose you from before the foundation of the earth, before the disruption, before he made man, he has to know the whole family tree, which means he has to know everything that happens that can affect it. Think about that. Jonah, chapter 1, verse 4. Jonah disobeyed God. God told him to go to Nineveh. He wanted uh, his word spoken there. And Jonah said, oh, I'm not going to do that. He hopped on a, on, a, on a ship that went somewhere else. But the Lord hurled, who did it? The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. God does these things. Later on, we're going to find there's four angels that control the winds that are under God's command. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. It's outside of us, but he does reveal a lot in his word. And once you get Holy Spirit, he can give you more insight because you're connected to him and you can understand spiritual things then. Back here, they didn't have Holy Spirit to understand uh, spiritual things. From man's point of view, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This thing about God setting eternity in the human heart is interesting. Uh, when you think about atheists, they declare there is no God, but right in their heart, it's written there is a God. That's what this is talking about. It's written in their heart, so they have to be in denial to declare atheism. They're denying what's in their heart. That's called corrupting your heart. That's what it is. So we read in 1 Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honor come from you, God. You rule over all. That sounds like God's in control, doesn't it? You rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. It does lie in his hand to do that. It also lies in his hand to cut down the nations if he wants. And if it's in his plan, he is able to do that without sinning because of his purpose. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8. No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death. And there is no discharge in the time of war and evil will not deliver those who practice it. No man has control over these things. Only God does. In Job, which was the first book written in God's word, it's all about the sovereignty of God. Let's read what we find out in Job. Since man's days are determined, his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. Doesn't sound like chance death, does it? What about people that are murdered? Huh? In light of this verse, what about people that are murdered? God knows their number of months. He has determined and he has set limits so that he cannot pass. We'll talk more about murder later. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Have no doubt about it. God said it. He he brings to pass all his pleasure. Romans 13.1 Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. See that? No authority on this earth exists except from God. That has to include the devil, God's adversary, who has authority over this world that he inherited from Adam. No authority can exist except from God. And those which exist are established by God. This is talking about civil government here, but this is talking about any authority at all in the heavens and the earth. It's all from God. But God put governing authorities here to be his right arm in this world to uphold justice. Obviously, they have failed. And that's why Christ has to return to set up his own righteous government at the end of this current eon. In Isaiah 45, 12, we read, it is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, and I ordained all 
their host. Their host is the spiritual beings in the heavens. Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Oh, now, wait a minute. Rick, you're telling me God created wicked people? No, I'm not saying that. The Word of God does. See, I'm not the author here. I'm just communicating what it says. Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. There's a purpose in everything God does. Everything that happens in life has a purpose. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 16. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? See, that's the question that comes up. We say God cannot do evil. He can do whatever he wants because he's God. That's what we have to understand. God is sovereign, but he does everything with a purpose for a greater glory. So we can't judge him by our standards. We cannot. We cannot put ourselves in God's shoes. And we can't do what he does. So is there unrighteousness with God? Paul's answer is, God forbid. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He's not obligated to anybody for anything. It's all his choice. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that shows mercy. See that? It's not him that willeth. What about man's free will? He says it's not of him that wills. You didn't get saved if you're a believer. You didn't get saved because you willed it. That's the big thing, you know. They say God can't save everybody because of man's free will. He gave man free will. He cannot overcome or uh, do he can't alter man's free will. It says right here in Romans, after Jesus Christ came, revealed the, uh, as they say, revealed the kingdom of the adversary. This is after that. So then it is not of him that wills, the person who wills, nor of him that runs. So it's not by willing, it's not by working, but of God that shows mercy. It's God's choice. Exodus 9.16, talking about Pharaoh. Uh, this is, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. This was spoken to Pharaoh. Pharaoh raised him up from birth for this specific purpose. Do you think God might, might really be in control? If he can cause somebody to be born and for a specific purpose, he must be in control, right? God creates or makes people in situations just to carry out his will, just like with Joseph in Egypt. Raised up a whole nation so he could show his glory and reveal himself to man. It's, it's amazing what God does. Everything has a purpose. It's, this is talked about also in Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. That's why he raised him up. He says that about other kings too, like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Tyre. He says that, I raised you up for this purpose. Romans 9, verses 19 through 24. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? If God's doing all these things, the, this is a logical answer to uh, somebody who doesn't trust God or understand him. But Paul, let's see how Paul answers. Nay, but, O man, who are you that replies against God? Why are you questioning what God does? He is in control. Thank God he's a good God. I'm so thankful he's not an evil God because he could toy with us all day, do whatever he wants for our evil, for our own destruction. But his will is good. He is God. He is love. I want him in control, don't you? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Has not the power, potter the power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another to dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, 
endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Afore prepared. Remember, I told you if you believe now, you were chosen from before the disruption of the earth. He afore prepared you for glory. But some he fits as vessels of wrath for destruction. Doesn't sound like a loving God unless you know the complete story. Even us whom he's called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Talking about Jesus, God's own son, only begotten son. It pleased the Lord God to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In this verse you have both the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to life. God often talks about the sufferings of Christ in the Old Testament, but never without revealing the glory that's going to come. Isn't that something? He always counterbalances the suffering with a promise of the future, of what the result of that is. Why did God bruise him? It says God did, his own son. This is God saying he did it. We can believe what man says, or we can believe what God says. God himself says he does it here because of the outcome. That was the only way to get the outcome. So God is justified in all his doings, and he's going to bring all sons into glory. Acts verse 2 uh, chapter 2, verse 23. This Jesus, delivered up according to the de definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You got it? God set that all up. Colossians 1.17. He, Christ, is before all things, and in him all things subsist or cohere or hold together. God is in control and he's placed Christ over all things. The whole universe holds together from that. He has to be in control for this. There's no question about it. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the eons, it should say, ages for our glory. Well, if he knew these things before, it reminds us of that first verse we read a while back that God knows the end from the beginning. He chose us from before the foundation of the earth. That's one of the secrets that he's talking about here. So Rick, what about the devil? This evil being that uh, was perfect and fell. <laughs> the devil, God's adversary, is real and has limited authority over all the creatures on earth. He, us he usurped that authority from Adam. When Jesus was tempted by the devil to control all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus did not deny he had the right to offer those kingdoms to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10 contains this, um, presents this temptation. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kings of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, You don't have the kingdoms to give to me. You're a liar. No, he said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. So Jesus didn't uh, deny what he said. He didn't uh, tell him he was wrong. He agreed. But he says, I don't want it from you. Because the word says, I'm to worship God only and serve him. Do you realize what the devil wanted to do there? He wanted to give Jesus everything he's going to have anyway without having to go through the crucifixion, without, without having to go through the suffering. He tempted Jesus to, to overcome his suffering by just taking control of the kingdoms of the world then. But Jesus wouldn't do it. He decided instead to lay his life down for us. That's our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John, 1 John 5.19 we read, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. That's the authority of the evil one. 
uh, Zuzia, authority. Uh, he got it from Adam. He usurped it from Adam when Adam, because Adam was given dominion of the earth, remember? He uh, disobeyed God and the tempter was given it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. In which you formerly walked, you believers, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, that's word eon, this word course, eon of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So this adversary is a spirit and he has authority over the creation, over over this planet, earth, maybe all of them, I'm not, I don't know. The prince of the power of the air. That's what he's called. Second Corinthians 4.4 4. In whom the God of this world, and this again is the word eon, ion in the Greek, not cosmos, which would be translated world, should be translated eon. In whom the God of this eon has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Why does it call the devil a God here? The verse is saying we have that, that the devil is the God of this world. The word God is a title, not a person. It is applied to the adversary because the adversary usurped the authority God delegated to Adam over the creatures on earth. He became the God or ruler of the world systems from Adam through to the present time. The word world should have never been translated, should be translated eon, demarking a limited period of time. The Greek word ion is used instead of the actual word for world, which is cosmos. God's adversary is the God or ruler of this eon, only this period of time during which evil reigns. But it is all for God's purpose. Our Savior was crucified during this eon. That's the greatest evil, killing the greatest good. But God raised him from the dead. This is the real lesson of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. You take that tree, it became a cross. That's the lesson of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the cross of Christ. The adversary can only do what God bids him to do. Keep that under your mind. He's not running rogue down here doing what he wants with God running after him to clean up the mess. That's not what it is. That defames God. It, de it degrades God. It, it makes God uh, impotent, if you will. But God is not. He's in control of all things. The adversary can only do what God allows him or bids him to do. Again, in Job, the book on the sovereignty of God, verses 6 through 8 of the first chapter. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, that's the term for this Council of God in the Old Testament, we're going to talk about in a little time, in a little time. Angels, messengers, the council of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Satan means adversary, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and escheweth evil, despises evil? What's going on here? We have God calling Satan to himself, saying, hey, Job's down there. He's a pretty righteous dude. What do you think about him? Have you considered him? Then Satan answers the Lord in verse 12, he says, or in verse 9, Does Job fear God for naught? Is that what you're telling me, God? Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. God puts a hedge around people that he wants to protect, doesn't he? He has a hedge around us in the body of Christ. Only he can let that hedge down or we can let evil in. But in this case, God lets the hedge down. He tells Satan, put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse thee to thy face. Or the, the devil says this, I'm sorry. 
Put forth your hand, God. Touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, you can attack Job. Just don't physically harm him. You can touch everything he has, but not him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord to do his wicked deeds. Look at, so can you see from that account that God is in control? Why did he let that happen to Satan? To show his sovereignty, that he can do what he wills. He restored Job twice of all that he had, and he'll take care of his family at the consummation. Don't worry about it. It all will be taken care of. That's the thing we don't understand. There's an end game to this that we are unaware of, that God is fully aware of, but he has revealed part of it to us uh, with a consummation. So look at this one. Finally, God captures that old servant, the devil, and chains him up. In Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2, I, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. One angel, a lone angel, is going to come along, and he laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. This God's word is so deep. I mean, this ver it says so much in so few words. This dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. So it tells you, this is the verse that tells you the serpent in the Garden of Eden was the devil himself, which was the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. So they lay, they finally capture the devil, God does, and puts him away with chains. And what does it take? A whole army? Does it take Michael and all his angels fighting against the devil? No, it takes one lone angel. An angel came down from heaven. He had the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of that dragon, the old serpent, and bound him a thousand years. But look what God does at the end of the thousand years of Christ's millennial kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. What? Why would God let him loose after finally capturing him? Finally, he's got his adversary in chains. Did the adversary slip out on his own? No, because it says he looses him. So the answer to the question is God let the devil loose after capturing him because God has one more job for him to do, to stir up the nations. Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. When the thousand years, that's Christ's millennial reign, are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together into battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea, can you believe this? With Christ present during the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of paradise, there's going to be a just millions, maybe billions of people that don't want any part of him. That's regenerate, degenerate man. That, that's the state man, mankind is in, even with Christ present. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. They go to Jerusalem, try to overthrow Christ. Encompassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down out of God, from God out of heaven and devoured them. God does this. You say, well, it's okay for him to do that to evil people. So God can kill, right? Yes, God can give life. He can kill for his purpose, whatever that purpose is, which is always ultimately for the good. That's why he can do it. We can't fight evil with evil because we can't control the end result. God can. Now, I want to talk about this divine counsel of God that few people know about. It helps us understand the world and why, the way it is and who's in control. That's what it helps us understand. The Word of God presents a divine counsel that God oversees. The term divine counsel is an academic synonym for God's heavenly host, the spirit beings that inhabit the spiritual world. This is God's worldview we're learning. These members administer the cosmos under God's direction. In Deuteronomy 32, 7, we read, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of past ages. Ask thy father, and he shall relate to thee thine elders, and they shall tell thee. 
when the Most High divided the nations, the 70 nations right after the flood, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God, excuse me. Some translations have uh, the number of Israelites, but we don't even have Israelites here. And his people Jacob became later the portion of the Lord. Israel was the line of his inheritance. But God set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. The Septuagint translators plainly understood that the sons of God, Bani Elohim, spoken of in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and elsewhere, were spirit beings or angels and rendered it that way several times in Job 1, 6, 2, 1 and 38, 7 in order to clarify the meaning. So the sons of God all through the Old Testament means spirit beings. God, El Elyon, in Deuteronomy 32, 8, divided the earth according to the number of heavenly beings who already existed from the time of creation. Why is he doing that? To give them dominion. The paraphrased Aramaic translation of De Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9, found in the ancient Targum Pseudo Jonathan supports the Septuagint reading of verse 8, but also hints at the origin of the later alternate reading, Sons of Israel. Deuteronomy, thir Deuteronomy 32 8. When the Most High made allotment of the world unto the nations which proceeded from the sons of Noah in the separation of the writings and languages of the children of men at the time of the division, he cast a lot among the seventy angels the princes of the nations, with whom is the revelation to oversee the city, even at the time he established the limits of the nations according to the sum of the number of the seventy souls of Israel who went down into Mizraim, Egypt. That's translated by J.W. Etheridge. Interesting, huh? The Bible clearly suggests that angels of different ranks have charge of individuals and nations. No doubt, in light of modern cosmology, this concept, if retained at all, as biblically it must be, ought properly to be extended, as the dual sense of the phrase host of heaven suggests, to the oversight of the elements of the physical universe, planets, stars, and nebulae. So God has a spiritual a force, a council of spiritual beings over the earth. He assigns territory and specific jobs to them, and that's how God is in control through his creatures. He doesn't have to have creatures to be in control, but this is how he has delegated it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. People say this, who is this us? They make a big deal. What, who is this us? And of course, the Trinitarians say he's talking about it's Jesus and the Holy Spirit he's speaking with. Let us make man in our image. Is that what it means? No, because there is no Trinity, first of all. Jesus is the first created being, according to Colossians 1. He's a created being in the image of God. The image cannot be what it's imaging. It's a reflection of the original. That's the image of God. Jesus would be is just like God. He's the image of God. And God's put him in control, so he acts as God to us, but he is not the deity. He's the son of the deity. And we uh, take nothing from Jesus by saying he's the son of God, because that's what he said. But we give everything to God, who God rightly is, the only deity over all. So who is this us talking about? This verse is often used by modern scholars to attempt to prove that the doctrine of the Trinity can be found in the Old Testament. Regarding this erroneous contention, the Eerdmans Bible Dictionary states, the us in let us make our man in our image refers to the sons of God or lesser gods mentioned elsewhere. In, uh, he has some references here. Here viewed as a heavenly council centered around the one God. In later usage, these probably would be called angels. We'll look at Psalm 82, 1 next. So let us, he's talking to the council, this divine council that he has to run things. Let us make, it's a council meeting. He, we're going to see one very shortly. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. 
and beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Now here, hosts of heaven is talking about the planets, the sun, the moon, the stars. But there's a duality in here of this term. It also refers to spiritual beings. The host of heaven here is said to be allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. The word allotted in Hebrew is shalak, which literally means apportioned or assigned. In a statement similar to Deuteronomy 32.8, we are told here that Yahweh assigned the host of heaven to the peoples of the earth. Yeah. The host of heaven are the same spiritual principalities, powers, and mights and dominions that Paul speaks of like in uh, Ephesians 6.18. These heavenly powers are mentioned many times in the New Testament. In Matthew 24.29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Romans 8.38, these powers of heaven, the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us out of the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in heaven or below earth or anywhere, not even you, can separate you from the love of God. But he's talking about principalities and powers here. Ephesians 1.20 which he worked in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenlies. That's the power God has. Far above every principality, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this eon, it should read, but also in uh, those to come, it should say. There's two more to come. Hebrews 2.5, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, implying that this world is subjugated, subjected to angels. And here's Psalm 82.1 that I promised, a psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now remember, God is a title. That's all it is. So he's giving that title to these lower spiritual beings that he created. He's the only deity, but he calls these gods. He holds judgment through this council. Spirit beings are called gods here because of the authority delegated to them by the one God who is over all. Let's learn more about this council. Psalm 89, 5 through 7. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who is in the skies? can be compared to you. Who in the skies can be compared to you? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. This is not talking about the congregation of Israel. It's talking about this heavenly council that he has. The divine council is said to meet with God and to decide the fate of people and nations. For example, we are shown a meeting of this divine council to decide how the spirit members of his council will carry out God's decree that Ahab must die. Ahab sinned against the Lord, he must die. So God's talking with the council to see how, how, to, how, to, how to accomplish that. Of course, God knows, but it, it pleases him to work with others. So that's what we're going to read about. 1 King chapter 22, verses 19 through 23. And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one, one said one thing, another said another. So God is inviting an angel to volunteer to one of these in the divine council to go and do this work. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to, God says to him, 
you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and entice him. You will succeed. I'm going to make sure it happens. So who is setting up Ahab here for his death? God gives life. He's able to take it. It's all in his hands, like Job said. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. God, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because we know it's all for good in the end. We know the end of the story because God was pleased to tell us. So, now behold, and this is what the lying spirit says. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Disaster. The divine council meets to decide the fate of empires. In Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, we read, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, his wheels burning with fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's a million. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Or ten million, isn't it? Ten times. Yeah, it's ten million. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. The council, or the court, took their seats, these thrones, and the meeting began. So you can see a meeting being assembled here, the divine council. In Daniel 4.13, Nebuchadnezzar is visited by a watcher, a holy one. This divine being tells the king what awaits him and describes the verdict as by decree of the watchers in Daniel 4.17. A few verses later, Nebuchadnezzar's fate is described as a decree of the Most High. So these watchers, this council, does the decree of the Most High, not whatever they want to do. They aren't telling what God to do. He, you know, often he, he works like we, he works with people and he uses uh, a figure of speech to make it appear like he's one of us on our level. So like when Adam disobeyed God and hid himself behind the, the, uh, the trees and everything, trying to hide, God uh, walked up in his manifested form, that whatever form that was, it met with Adam every day. That's what Adam was hiding from, by the way. He, he went and says, where are you, Adam? As if he didn't know. See what I'm saying? He, he condescends. It's condescensio is the figure. He condescends to the level of man to equate himself with us so we can understand better what he's saying. So these decrees, they're, they're carried out by these, the council and, and their servants, their spirit servants, but they're a decree of the Most High showing us again that God is in control, even through this council. God is the one in control. In Daniel 10, 5, 6, and Dan, let's say that again. Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, and verses 12 and 13, we're going to read. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl, his face the appearance of lightning. Wow, bright his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, the sound and his words like the voice of a multitude. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for whom the first day, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So God heard Daniel's prayer and sent, I mean, yeah, and sent this angel. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, says the angel. The prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. This is talking about these spiritual leaders, these spiritual principalities and powers in the might. One wanted to withstand, keep Dan, uh, this angel from speaking with Daniel. And uh, Gabriel, uh, Emma Michael came and helped him out. It was Gabriel was the angel that got helped out, by the way. <clears throat> Daniel 10.20. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? The angel says to Daniel, 
Now I must return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I am through with him, the prince of Greece will come. So we see ongoing spiritual battles here among these spiritual creatures. But I am to tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. That's what he came to Daniel for. There is no one with me who contends against these princes except Michael, your prince. These princes, angelic beings. So we see that God rules the earth through a divine council of watchers that he places over people and nations. That is how God controls everything that happens according to his own immutable will. The very wind and seas respond to the spirits in charge of them, believe it or not. Revelation 7, 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the winds that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. God has angels controlling the weather, controlling the winds. So when we get... Uh, Earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes. Spirits are causing these things because they are in control. They're not just nat nat uh, natural phenomenon as we think they are. Revelations chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So we see these four angels are also capable of hurting the earth. That, that verse is from the book of Revelation, still future. You should see by now that anything and everything that happens is totally under God's direction and control. If God was not in control, chaos would result. We cannot look at the world the way it is now and perceive that God is in control. We have to look to God's word instead to learn about these things because it tells us why the present state of things are the way they are. So now, what about man's free will? Let's learn the truth about man's free will. Answer, man's will is not free. It's limited to certain specific limited options. Man has choice but it's severely limited to the options God presents. Proverbs 20, verse 24, Man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can he, man understand his way? God, God guides us. Proverbs 16, 9, The heart of man makes his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So man thinks he's making up his own uh, rules or uh, making his own plans, but the Lord establishes his steps. The Lord makes sure he does what the Lord wants him to do to complete his plan, which is to bless everybody, not just that person. Proverbs 21.11, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. What about that verse? Where's free will in that verse? The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. God can influence a person to change his will in a flash, just with a breeze, with one word. That's all it takes. So man's will is no obstacle for God. It's no barrier that God cannot get through. And it's no barrier that God will not get through because it's God who turns the heart the way he wills. See that? Out of the heart come the issues of life. So heart is equated with will. Out of the heart is the issues of life, Jesus said. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Pretty wise person there. It's the Lord that directs the man's steps. Whether good or evil. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. They cast lots in the Old Testament under God's guidance. Uh, to decide issues and situations, to judge with. They had different colored uh, stones. They would throw them in a, uh, cast them into a bag in their lap, roll them around, and they pick one out, and that would be the answer. Uh, but the decision was always from the Lord. So man's will is pliable, fickle, and can be char changed with a breeze. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. 
The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will, I will, God says, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. God hardening somebody's heart. What about free will there? Exodus 7, verses 3 through 14. But I will handle, harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. This gives this a rare occurrence of God telling us why he's doing something. It makes it very obvious that he is in control. God is hardening Pharaoh's heart so he could multiply his signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. In Exodus 4.8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as a nation, as the sons of Israel are going out boldly as they're approaching the water of uh, the, during the Exodus. Deuteronomy 2, verse 30, but Sihon, king of Heshbon, was not willing for us to pass through his land. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to deliver him into your hand as he is today. See why God does things? To bring his will to pass. He hardens people's hearts. He does whatever he needs to do. Now people teach that there's an idiom of permission here. That God's just claiming he's doing these things, but it's really the devil doing it. But all that teaching does is glorify the devil. God is in control. That's what glorifies God. Pharaoh's heart heart was so weak, his will was so weak, he would have let the Israel, Israelites go after one or two miracles. But God had a heart in his heart because he wanted to perform all ten miracles. He had to make sure that they were not released those ten times. Each one of those judgments of God during the Exodus defeated or humiliated one of the Egyptian gods. And it showed Egypt, their gods were nothing, God is Lord over all. That's why God did it. But he had to harden Pharaoh's heart to get all 10 miracles in. Now I'm going to give you the most quoted verse in the New Testament from Isaiah, chapter 6. Verse 10, we start. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ear dulls, their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. So why doesn't Israel as a whole believe God now? Because of this verse in Isaiah 6.10. Jesus quoted this when he closed off his ministry in Matthew, around Matthew 13. And Paul gave it when he closed off the commission kingdom, uh, uh, the commission, his commission to the kingdom in uh, Acts 28, around verse 28. Paul quotes it also. Uh, it's telling them that God is making them dull for a period of time, so they won't believe. Only a remnant of Israel is saved during this present time that will believe right now. The rest have been hardened, it says in, in uh, Romans chapter 11. Eventually, God will lift that spirit of stupor, he calls it over them. And But see, can you see that God hardens people's hearts to bring his will to pay? He does whatever he needs to to work out his plan, which is for our glory. Man's free will cannot save him. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that's Christ, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, it's not the will of man that gets saved. They say, we have free will to make the choice for God or not, and if people don't make the choice, they're going to burn in hell forever because they didn't choose correctly. Well, it says those who believe in God are not born by the will of man. You don't get saved by deciding you want to be saved. God has to give people the faith to believe is what it boils down to. And only he can do that. So he chose people and he's given those people a measure of faith right now. Later, everybody's going to come in. And you'll find that out in my Eonian Times course or in my book on God's purpose in creation, also available from livefaith.tv. So, sonship from God doesn't come from the will of man. Not at all. Proverbs 16.1 the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. We can make all the plans we want, but the Lord ends up what he's doing, what he wants to do with us. 
John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Anybody who comes to Jesus, he'll raise him up on the last day. So, what this is showing you is the authority of God. Man needs God's help to be saved. John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatsoever ask, you ask the Father in my name, he will give it unto you. So we didn't choose him. He chose us. He's talking to Israel. Romans chapter 3, verse 1. No one understands. No one seeks after God. That's why he has to seek them out himself. 9.11b of Romans. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. God has to have foreknowledge to be able to call. He has to know everything that's happening. Romans 9.16. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who is mercy. There we have it. Not on human will. And so God has to seek man in order to save him. Anyone who believes does only so because God gave that person to believe. In Acts 13.48 we read, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life or Eonian life believed. Those who were appointed tells us that it's not, it's by appointment. It's by God choosing people that they're able to believe. So it says in uh, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your own doing it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Again, it's all God's doing. Second Timothy 1 9, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. That's why God called us for his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the eons began. Romans 8, 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So God foreknew. He has to know all things to foreknow. And he called us to his own purpose and grace. Sorry. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Even now, when you're saved, you get God's Spirit in you, and he's, it says he's working in you to, to will of your will? No, his will. To will and to do for his good pleasure. How about free will there? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What a great section of scripture to learn and memorize, because this is all about what God's plan is here. It shows you that God wills, will have all men to be saved. And here it is in 1 Timothy 4.10. For to this end we toil and strive, Paul says, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. He's the Savior of all, but there's a special group in here, those who believe by faith now, and the Israelites who believe by faith before Christ returns. That's who the ones who are especially are. That's the special. That we get something special. We're the first ones out. <laughs> Israel's the second one to get uh, blessed. And then finally, everybody else at the, con at the consummation. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men understanding, men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. What about that verse? Time and chance happens to them all. Well, Solomon wrote that from man's point of view, not God's. Like that one verse said, we can't know anything about what, we can't know much about what God's doing from the earthly standpoint. So 
this is from man's point of view. Time and chance, it appears like it's time and chance happening to them, but otherwise, you know, it's not. It's God's will. Otherwise, God could not say he orders all things according to the counsel of his own will. Very easy to make that connection. If God was not in control, we could never fully trust him because of the unknown. Who knows something's not going to happen in the future? Something busts through from another universe God never knew about and destroys us. I mean, how can we trust God if what he's doing now is a mess? If, if it's not under his control now, how can we trust God in the future? It destroys trust. You can trust God now, though, because he orders all things out of the counsel of his own will. God has a purpose in all creation, to become all in all his creatures. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, which we'll look at in a minute. He wants to, to you to live. He wants to live through his creatures to bless all. He wants to live through you to bless you and everybody you come in contact with. That's what God wants. He wants all to be all in his creatures, 100%, and for him to be all by their creatures. He wants his creatures to think of him as all, and he's going to be in all of us. How much free will are you going to have left then? It's, there's only room for one will in the universe. You'll still have your individuality. Don't worry. You'll still be able to glorify and praise God and be creative and everything else because he's the creative God. He's going to be all in you. It's going to be beautiful. Don't worry. So God uh, has a purpose. He created evil to teach man good from evil and to offset evil with evil. The devil was a liar from his beginning, Jesus said. It says from the beginning in uh, King James and other versions. But the tense of the word in the combination of, of the uh, uh, the case, the case, the tenses of the word show that you can either supply um, a here, a beginning or or a proper noun it has to be that a or a proper noun. And in this context, it's the proper noun, his beginning from his beginning. The devil was a liar from his beginning, which means he didn't start out perfect and then fall. No, that's a lie. He was made perfect. No, he was made evil for a specific purpose, to be the black backdrop on which God could reveal himself. That's what it is. That's why he made the devil, to be the black backdrop so man could learn good from evil, uh, love from indifference. Man must learn in good evil to be like God, remember, to be in the image of God. God provided for man salvation before he even made man. The lamb was slain from the disruption of the earth in Revelation 13, 8. So we knew God planned for this because he had already provided for man's salvation. Through evil, sin, suffering, and death, God shows man what it is to be without God and without hope in this world. In Ephesians, we've read that. As believers, reading Ephesians says, in prior times, you were without God and without hope in this world. That's the state of all mankind until he raised out Israel and gave them a hope. So this is what we're going through these Eonian times. It helps you understand why things are the way they are. It's by God's design. Through evil, sin, suffering, and death, God shows man what it is to be like without him, without God, without hope in the world. Then, through judgment... God reveals his righteousness to man and contrasts it with man's lack of righteousness. When the person realizes his impotence and his heart cries out to God, then the blood of Jesus Christ's cross cleanses him and God does what he does. He's the Savior. He saves him through Christ. That's how all people are going to be saved. See, it's through judgment and salvation that God reveals himself. He let man go his own way, and then he's going to show him the errors of his ways, and uh, God will, will be able to love, man will be able to love God finally, because he'll know good from evil and uh, love from indifference and hate. That's the whole purpose of this Eonian times we're going through. So when the person realizes his impotence and his heart cries out, to God, then the blood of Jesus Christ cross cleanses him and God saves him. This is how God will save all his creatures. 
So in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept, meaning everybody else is still dead. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all are dying, it should read, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The same ones who are dying, all are going to be made alive in Christ. When evil has served its purpose, it will be purged from the universe and won't even be an option to consider. It has a purpose at this present time. So God will subdue all things under Christ's feet before all is done. And after that, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 26 through 28, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he, God, has put all things under him, Christ, under his feet. But when he, God, says all things are put under Christ, it's manifest that God is accepted, which did put all things under Christ. God. So Christ is overall under God, like Joseph and the Pharaoh. When all things shall be subdued, and not until then, but when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that put all under him, that God may be all in all. So at one point in time, the Son, Jesus Christ, is going to cast down his, his throne, lay it at God's feet, turn the kingdom over to him, and assume his position under God, his, his state, his placement under God. He always has uh, subdued, uh, submitted unto God, but now this is, he's no longer in control anymore because God is all in all. And anything between God and one of his creatures is an imposition at that point. God will be all in you. Imagine that. Nobody in between. So the true story is God created the heavens and the earth so he could be all in all his created beings. God loses nothing. This is the true story of the glory of our great God and his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, you can trust God because God is in control of all things. He has a heavenly council he works through. He gave his uh, people Holy Spirit in this day and time. Man's free will is fickle. It's not going to get him saved. Only God can save. And that's how he's doing things. He's giving people faith to believe, but in stages. Christ the first fruits, then he gives us faith, uh, those that are our Christ that is coming. The rest will come later at the consummation when he gives them faith. Israel, it says in uh, Romans 11, all Israel shall be saved. But right now, there's a spirit of stupor, he calls it, over the ones who don't believe. Only a small remnant are trickling into the church of Christ today. The rest are blinded, he said, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So who blinded them? It can't be the devil because the devil would never lift the blinding. God's going to lift that blinding. God caused it. Always remember, God is in control. I can't tell you why Aunt Betty got murdered by Uncle Jack, but God will at the, at the gathering together when we meet Jesus. He'll tell you why because he knows it all. And there's no difference between God's uh, declarative will and his permissive will because if he allows it, it's still his will. What we can be assured of is that God is good. God is love. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. No matter what he does, he does not sin. He does not any uh, do any unrighteousness. It all has a purpose and a reason. So you can trust God because God is in control of all things. I invite you to investigate the truth about God, what he is doing, and what he is doing. Visit Live Faith TV. Download my book on God's purpose in creation, the consummation of all things. Download the Eonian Times Charts book. And there's a bunch of other stuff up there. Take your time, go through it. If you need help, you can reach me through the contact page at Live Faith TV. Learn the word of God that will make you free. And I see I've got this over here. This was not the discussion on Romans. Sorry about that. We'll just take that off. <laughs> but I just use some of these presentations over and over again and to make it easier. But visit Live Faith TV and, and see what we have there. Uh, on my YouTube channel, there's a bunch of videos, too, to help you understand this stuff. My name is Richard. I love you in Christ Jesus.
Thank you for sticking with me. Go over this if you don't understand it. There's a lot of verses in there. You need to go over it again, one, two or three times. Share it with a friend. Comment below this video. Even if you dissent, comment. Let's talk about it. That's the only way we get to the truth. God bless you in Jesus' name. Have a great day.